a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, I want to very quickly establish uh, welcome you first of all to the latest in our ongoing series by the uh, board of directors and its social justice committee. Uh, we've had some wonderful conversations with uh, folks on both sides of the border, and I think you will find today's discussion uh, just uh, informative and, and just scintillating. Uh, first, I wanted to establish some ground rules. Uh, whenever we talk about issues relating to social justice and, and race and gender and gender identity, these can sometimes be emotional issues. And I would hope and expect that everyone in attendance will treat this topic uh, with the sensitivity and the respect uh, that it deserves. Uh, I reserve the right as the moderator uh, to uh, cut off any discussion that is um, that, that violates uh, these very modest and, and simple rules. Um, so with th those ground rules out of the way, I also want to remind everyone that we have just had uh, a somber anniversary just yesterday, uh, the one year mark of the murder of George uh, George uh, Perry Floyd Jr. Uh, of a movement in the United States and around form, and for the notion that every person, regardless of their background, uh, deserves uh, to live and not have any interaction with police be a death sentence. Um, we're here today to talk about corporate response uh, to anti-Asian sentiment uh, and hate. Um, based on the uh, most current data we have, uh, federal hate crime data for 2020 has not been released, but we know that hate crimes in the United States in 2019 were at their highest level in over a decade. In Canada, there have been over 1,100 cases of racist incidents and attacks. Um, uh, the majority of those are in, have been in Ontario, and British Columbia. 60% of the cases reported were against women and 84% were against East Asians. Those under 18 and over 55 are the most likely to be assaulted. Uh, so with that contextual setting, I'd like to briefly introduce, uh, introduce our illustrious panel. Uh, with us today are uh, four real leaders uh, in the United States and Canada. Uh, on, on business uh, issues. The first person I'd like to introduce is Mr. Uh, Julian Ha. Uh, Julian is a partner at Hydric and Struggles uh, in Washington, D.C. and leads the Global Government and, uh, Go Government and Policy and Association Practices. We're also pleased to be joined by Jane Wang, who's the CEO of Optimi uh, Optimity. Uh, a health rewards company that incentivizes members to live healthier and longer. This platform has been adopted by consumers, employers, and insurance carriers, NGOs, and affiliate partners on shared holistic health outcomes. Uh, next, we have Ms. Olivia Wong, who's a senior partner at Prototype Thinking Labs. She's a Chinese American entrepreneur, award winning humanitarian, and just Asian global. She is on a mission to teach empathy through human-centered design. And last but not least, we have Ms. Rebecca Yu, who serves as Vice President of Market Access and External Affairs at Takeda Canada Incorporated. She currently um, is the Business Unit Head of GI and the VP for Market Access and External Affairs, uh, a little bit similar to the job that, that I hold at T-Mobile. Um, so why don't we jump right into uh, the questions for our panel? I really want to facilitate a discussion between them uh, because I think this may be the first time that the four have actually been able to talk about some of their shared experiences. And in many ways, we will be watching that discussion uh, and learning as well. Uh, so why don't we go uh, first with a general question to the group. Um, uh, and, and, and that is, how have you experienced anti-Asian hate or bigotry in your personal lives or in your careers? Um, and and I, I, I won't uh, start in any particular order, but maybe for this one, I'll ask uh, Julian to, to go first and then we'll just do it organically after that. Julian? Sure. Th sure. Thank you so much, Clint. And, and thank you, Scotty, for convening this 
really important discussion. So on, honored to be part of this. Um, so look, I, you know, on the personal side, uh, you know, not to get too personal, but sure, I, I was born in New York City. I'm a child of immigrants from from communist China who fled and started with, with nothing. Um, and, you know, growing up in public schools in New York City, um, at the time, I was probably the only Asian in any of those classrooms. Maybe that's dating me in some ways. Uh, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Um, and yes, I was called names. I was uh, sometimes singled out. Um, and I, one searing thing I do remember <laughs> still was I think in, in third grade, when I was pulled aside to uh, take a sort of an English competency test um, and no one else was. And uh, this is despite the fact that I was probably in the highest scoring <laughs> category of all my classes. And it always bu bugged me to be totally honest um, because I think that was not to put it too strongly, but that was some profiling going on, right? This person didn't look like he was American, quote unquote, um, and uh, therefore we just wanna make sure that his his language skills were up to scratch, which again, ironically, you know, I was at the top of the class. So that's, again, now that's a long, long time ago. Um, fast forward, professionally, I, I don't think hate would be sort of the right word. It's a little bit more subtle, um, but perhaps still as pernicious in some ways. And that's something we're all gonna, I think, talk about in a second, which is around exclusion or invisibility, right? I think often uh, APIs, America at least, are, are the only um, ones in the room. Uh, and I've come from many different professions. I've, I'm a recovering corporate attorney. I've been in venture capital, investment banking. Um, but I'll be honest, when I joined Executive Search 15 years ago, um, which is where I am right now, uh, the, the lack of diversity was even more stark. <laughs> And uh, now that's changing, and I'm part of some efforts, our own, own trade association, to address those issues. But again, the reason I bring it up is I, I find myself usually the only person in the room who's a person of color. Uh, I'm the only one who does uh, what I do, which is government affairs and trade associations, uh, who, who is an Asian American uh, in, th in the whole field. Uh, and there's only one other African American who does this. So those things, I think, uh, cause us to pause and think, you know, we, we feel like sometimes we have to prove ourselves a little bit more um, because we are the only one in the room. Um, but let me pause there because I know my other panelists will also have personal and professional experiences to share. Thank you, Julian. Pleasure. Anybody? I think Rebecca, you're on mute. And oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Rebecca, you're still muted, my friend. I see her lips moving, but my my lip reading skills have still not. Yes, uh, Here she is. Yes, yes. voila. <laughs> So um, I'll, I'll share a little bit of my personal story and uh, and thank you, Clint, and thank you, Scotty, for the opportunity. I want to also call out Sharon as well, um, who's also giving us this platform to share personal and also career uh, sort of challenges. Um, similar to what Julian described, maybe not New York City, but I was I was actually brought up. I wasn't born here. I was brought up, though. I flew in and came here from Hong Kong. And I grew up in Windsor, Ontario. So because I didn't grow up, grow up here, I didn't speak a word of English. And so it was a very difficult time at that time. I would say if I reflect on my childhood, uh, it's not the most diverse place in Windsor, Ontario, way back when. And both my sister and I grew up in probably pretty difficult. There was a lot of name calling and of course not speaking the language and looking different, dressing different. Uh, we were what your typical poor immigrant is. So we didn't have, we had hand-me-downs, um, not a lot of money. I had to fail two grades um, and learn the language quickly. Um, even though my mathematical skills and all that was, was up to par, I still need to learn the language. It took a long time to come out of that. And I have to say, um, it was like, aha, when I came to Toronto and it's like, wow, there's other people that look like me. <laughs> and I finally felt like that I was belonging in a place where I was starting to build confidence. 
I, I ended up going to U of T, which is also very diverse in university and, and finishing pharmacy school. Um, and I have to say it's it was a challenging time. And I've learned that, you know, racism isn't something that's you're born with, you're taught, right? And, and you really need to, that's why education is so important. And, you know, like other families that immigrated here, um, because we didn't have a lot of money, my parents, um, you know, and my a lot of my family worked in restaurants. Um, um, my mom worked in a wait as a waitress, you know, to pay for my piano lessons and my books and my studies. So that probably gives, you know, my husband was saying that's probably a lot that has to do with the drive I have. And I swore that I was never going to have my children wear hand-me-downs or go through what I had to do. So I worked very hard. And just like government affairs, like that's not a role that typically you see Asians in. And I, you know, no man, it, I, I recall one time I've had a manager says to me that you don't have what it takes to be in government affairs. And I showed them. And um, just recently, Takeda Canada was great and given me an opportunity to lead a business unit head for commercial. And I can tell you, there's not a lot of Asian women out there that would be leading in a pharma company for a business unit. And I don't know, for me, I never want to stop to prove myself, if you will. Um, I've been lucky in the sense that I've worked for companies that are very ethical, um, that values diversity, but there's something called unconscious bias. And there's that stereotype of what people believe, you know, what a leader should look like in corporate US or corporate Canada. And, you know, we're known to be Asians to do be doctors, potentially on one hand, you know, doctors, engineers, scientists. On the other hand, you know, they work in factories or restaurants and spas. And but where do you see Asians that are actually leading a team and leading a company and, and, and driving it? And so I think we have far to go. Um, but, you know, I'm going to pause here and let the other panelists speak as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, um, Olivia and Jane in, in no particular order. Um, please jump in. Jane, would you like to go? I can't see your screen, but I can defer to you. You know, you know what? Why don't you go Olivia? Um, we, we'll, we'll get Jane in here in a second. Have let her have the last word on this question. Happy to. So thank you again, Clint and Scotty, for having me and all of our esteemed and distinguished guests. My name is Olivia. My pronouns are she and her. I'm Chinese American. I was born in San Francisco, but I now proudly live in beautiful British Columbia in the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. My first experience with racism was when I was eight. I was living in Florida. A man called me a chink. I didn't really understand what that meant. I was still a child. As a teenager, my parents were dropping me off to see friends one afternoon. I remember walking on the street as I waved goodbye to my parents and a couple came towards me from the opposite direction and told me to go back to China. A year ago, I won a title, Miss Asian Global. It's an international title where I represent Asians worldwide, but specifically in the US and Canada. And since that day I won the title, I have received a numerous hate letters I've been the victim of cyberbullying. I've had aggression um, sent to me. I've had to do things like scrub my address on the internet to make sure that my family's information is not doxxed. And simply because one, I am a woman, two, I am minority, and three, I have been speaking about Asian and black solidarity. The type of aggression that I've faced in my life has really mostly been around the sexualization and the fetishization of my Asian female body. And it shows up in different ways, in very insidious ways. Recently, I was speaking at an event just like this, and I had an attendee unmute themselves off a uh, microphone and hurl a very hurtful, but also sexist comment to me and to other attendees in the audience. And I wish that I could say that this is a one-off occurrence, but it's sadly not. In British Columbia, we've seen a 717% rise in Asian American hate crimes. And eight in 10 Asian Americans back home in, in my country um, where I was born have said that they fear a violent attack against themselves, whether that be in a physical space or an online space. So I really do think this is uh, unfortunately a very dire situation. Um, my family back home is too scared to leave the house, to be quite honest. We've had so many attacks, murders, stabbings, and um, 
and just horrendous uh, acts of violence against us. And I do fear for my family and I fear for myself. And I also fear in many ways for the panelists and their families here in this room today. I'm, I'm sorry to hear about that. I, the United States has its own unique history mm -hmm. uh, with the over sexualization of Asian women, including bans on Asian women being able to marry Asian men, uh, other other horrible uh, crimes that that have been uh, that have been enshrined in, in the laws of the United States. Uh, more people need to know about that. Um, uh, Jane, you, you've got the last word here before we start to go go into individual questions. Yeah, and I really appreciate uh, everyone sharing their experience and I will start by sharing mine as well. So, uh, I'm a 1st generation immigrant uh, from China mainland. Uh, my home city is a city called Nanjing, which used to be the ancient capital for China for about 6 dynasties and. My, my family moved to Canada really to. Uh, to progress a professional career and uh, my dad's a geophysicist and my mom's an electrical engineer. So when we moved to Edmonton, um, I definitely had a similar experience to Justin as I'm one of the rare, <laughs> rare uh, uh, faces in, in, in the crowd there. And there were uh, children that uh, were not used to seeing people of Asian descent. And what was really fascinating to me is that it's not just necessarily that uh, people who are um, white or Spanish or uh, black that didn't weren't used to it. I remember there was a Cantonese little boy who uh, was Canadian and he hated the fact that uh, that I was there and was uh, going to like tarnish his uh, his 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 experience and whatnot. So so I you know he told me to go back to my country and that uh, I was not really Canadian like he was. So I think really discrimination doesn't necessarily come from other races. It sometimes also comes within people that look the same. Um, Fast forward, uh, I went to uh, McGill for my undergrad for biochemistry and I ended up doing my uh, post. I, I got an MBA from Ivy and then I went to Stanford for my executive education. And throughout that whole process, I met such amazing um, entrepreneurs and uh, people in business. I really made an impact in terms of health. My work is in health. I'm a mortality risk specialist. So I worked in phase two, phase three clinical trials, and I built technologies for large pharma companies. And I got a chance to work with Takeda as well, um, as well as Ono and uh, Biogen on some of the amazing life-saving uh, technology and tracking systems. So I got to work in HIV, ovarian cancer, MS, and Alzheimer's. And that I really didn't see my race um, really flare up again as a professional impediment. Uh, until I became an entrepreneur myself. I started my startup, um, this is actually my second startup. My first one failed to raise funding within Canada, not because of the fact that we didn't have traction, but because uh, less than 1% of all venture capital money go, in, go to female entrepreneurs. And then you kind of layer on the fact that I'm a minority and so on. So the odds were definitely not in my favor. And now with this uh, second company, I think what's really fascinating is that we have amazing track records. We have over 2 million people that we help um, literally on a daily basis to keep healthy and help them live longer uh, through optimity. And Sometimes I go into pitch rooms and boardrooms and I have two white, amazing men co-founders and I, I, people sometimes don't talk to me, right? They, they, they look, they're like, oh, what do you do? Are you in marketing? Or, um, I'm not seen as the de facto, uh, leader of our business, although I have now led it for seven years. So I think that's a pervasive um issue especially we're trying to elevate and rebecca talked about breaking the bamboo ceiling uh, i do think that such thing does exist and there is this layer of prejudice and layer of maybe just action bias 
and it votes in the form of attention. It votes in the form of investment dollars. Maybe it also comes in forms of client dollars. I'm not sure. And a lot of ways it's not directed at me, but you can see it in the data and you can see it by the overall numbers. And the last mention that I want to say is similar to Olivia, my family, um, my family is in Ottawa and uh, I'm, I'm by, I'm both in San Francisco and in Toronto. So I see a little bit less, but my family in Ottawa, my grandmother, uh, she's not tech savvy, but she tr really tried and she was reaching out to us um, because she's under quarantine, but she's afraid to leave her house because of the hate crimes that's been happening in, in Ottawa, like, which is kind of insane. And that really made me really dig my heels in to raise my voice and do my part in speaking and joining this conversation to educate and call to action better practices and what we're doing towards uh, um, changing the society for better. Thank you for that, Jane. And, and there are lots of comments coming in in the chat and people are very supportive of what they're hearing and, and thanking all of you for revealing these, uh, these sometimes painful uh, uh, stories. So I've heard a theme here of otherness that I think a lot of people can connect with that you aren't from this country uh, when, when you are in fact from this country and your contributions have built this country. I've also heard a little bit about this theme of, uh, well, well you're, you're so successful in school, you're so successful in business, uh, why are, are we here talking? I mean, aren't, um, AA, aren't members of the AAPI community really the model minority or adjacent white uh, people in, in business and in education and in all of these successful fields? Can we talk a little bit about this mythology around the model minority and why it is so particularly hurtful not only in the corporate context, but, but more broadly, uh, Julian, I want to bring you in on this 1st, and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll keep it going. This, this may be a, a new thing to certain people, the model minority myth. So, uh, please, can you talk a little bit about what it is and how it, how it has affected you and, and, and other, other people of Asian descent? Uh, sure, Clint, um, yeah, happy to kick it off. Um, so look, the, the myth itself, I think, is defined as the perception as you laid out that, um, you know, for, first of all, it presumes that Asians are, are a monolithic group, which we're not, certainly here in the US, and I suspect in Canada, that's the case. In fact, within the Asian community here in the US, at least, there is actually the greatest amount of, of disparity within, within our community. So you have some, uh, Asian groups that have been economically successful, um, but you have some that are extremely unsuccessful and below the poverty line. So to even uh, say that Asians are doing well, that's, you know, that's sort of a, uh, reflects a, a lack of understanding of, of, the, of the community itself and how diverse we are as a group. Um, but overall, it's, it's the perception, as you said, that, hey, we're all, succeeding we're going to great schools uh we're in well-paid professions what's there to complain about and at the surface yes that, that that seems plausible but the reality is when you dig into it um and i'm sure we'll get into in subsequent dialogue is that the the representation of aapis in leadership roles in management roles and raising venture capital um it is way below what the the proportion should be when you think of the the output of talent and the uh, the quantum of talent that's out there, uh, and, and as a marketplace, if I can put it that way. So, the you know it's 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 really pernicious and double edged because the thought of well, you know, and we talked about conscious bias as well. That also plays a big role where. Um, we're not thought of necessarily for certain types of positions. Um, and, and then the thought as well, we're doing fine. So, so why do, why are we even having this conversation? But again, the data doesn't lie. The numbers don't lie. The representation of, of, of Asian Americans who are 
not represented at senior management levels in certain professions, as we talked about, um, is a reality. And, and that's something that, you know, frankly, I, 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 uh, I like maybe some others, you know, this was not on my mind as much as it has been uh, in, in recent years. Um, but as we, you know, look to improve the, the arc of justice and society, that's something that I've, you know, been schooling myself in. And again, um, it, it, is, it is a fact, and that's something that at least in our profession, we try to address um, with our clients. Again, let me stop there because I know my fellow. No, I, I appreciate it, and 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 I want to go next to Jane, who's had the most uh, expressive face, <laughs> and and I think she has some things that she really wants to say, and I want to give her a chance to to talk here. Jane, the floor is yours. Yes, I agree with so much what uh, other people are sharing, and I, I really look at the data every day. Um, we're able to survey and interact and kind of lead some of the discussion around health because of the platform that I have with my day job. And, you know, the, the underlying current for the last 18 months has been this global pandemic of health. And um, overall society has been struggling for mental health. And we can see that in the numbers of the Americans who tell us that they have anxiety issues, they're dealing with everything from job loss to financial uh, struggles, to Canadians telling us really about their, uh, their overall lack of social connectedness under this very strict multi-wave lockdown. And what happens is kind of the compounded effect into this dirty aggression <laughs> towards people that you just don't see on a daily basis. You, 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 you no longer uh, have this appreciation for other races, perhaps. And I think that's where you are seeing really the true ugliness of flare up in different societies and uh, attacks uh, happening in a physical way or in verbal way and you know on the internet uh, and also in, in real life and and that's the part where i think the overall society has been shook because we removed the bond of social connectedness and i i want to call attention to that because that is the true foundation of the greatness of the north american <laughs> um continent is 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 the ability to really be either a melting pot or a jigsaw puzzle whatever whichever analogy you want to go through but it's really interacting with each other and learning from the different type of uh people that you interact with and you work with and res and respect and i think some of the fabrics of society have been pulled out from under us very good uh, thank you i i, I want to turn the question to to rebecca um, the, the, we've, we've talked here about North America almost a, a little bit as a monolith. We talked about some of the statistics in both countries, uh, for the rise of hate crimes and, and a lot of the, uh, stories are similar, but, but can you talk a little bit about, um, your perception of differences in the bias challenges faced by Asian Canadians and Asian Americans, uh, d does leadership at the top at the White House and 24 Sussex Drive make a difference? Has has it made a difference in the way that Asians uh, uh, in both nations have been impacted? Muted, Rebecca. Yeah, let me see. Can, can we? Okay, we got okay it. perfect. I don't know why it goes mute. Anyway, so. Thank you, um, but um, so I actually did some homework in preparation for this panel um, because, you know, if I were to look at the history of it, I actually, you know, I, I have some idea of the history of it, uh, but not clearly the differences, but I would say there's some consistency from a historic standpoint between, um, I think, Asian America, parent, Asian Americans and Asian Canadians in terms of how they were treated. 
Um, we hear about the Canadian head tax. I don't know if folks know about that or the Chinese head tax. In the late 1800s, you were charged a tax if you were to come and come to Canada from China. And the tax is basically to discourage uh, folks from immigrating to, to Canada. And so, and then following that, it was interesting is there was, I guess, two um, uh, pandemics of sorts. One is the bubonic plague and the other one was uh, the Spanish flu. And both Asians were targeted and for the Spanish flu, they were put in, um, they were excluded from going to the white hospitals. So I thought it was interesting that if you fast track 10, you know, 100 years from now, um, we're still dealing with the same situation with COVID-19. And the reason why uh, Asians were targeted was because they were seen to be not as clean or they're more, quote, dirtier because they're not, it's the hygienic piece. And, you know, I would say, you know, if you look at, you know, I follow social media and I'm sure you saw Brian Adams, who's a Canadian singer. And he tweeted up his social medias um, about, um, I wrote this down, bad eating and virus making people for the virus. So 100 years later, we're still sort of categorized the same way. Um, so I think Canada has this history and I, and I would actually uh, be remiss not to share also in the Second World War, I'm sure you know the Japanese Canadians were put in internment camps and ultimately they lost everything they had and some of them got deported. Um, so in modern day Canada, I have to say before I actually did the research on this, and of course I hear about the attacks in the newspapers and so forth, but my assumption was always that the U.S. was worse than Canada, just because Canada, you know, we're nicer people, technically speaking, we're quieter, we apologize all the time, we say I'm sorry all the time, and was I, was I wrong? So when I look up the stats it, it, per capita, there was actually more, a uh, higher number of anti-Asian hate crimes or incidents per capita in the US. So, you know, it's surprising because you think, okay, well, that can't happen. And, you know, and I don't know if US politics pick up on this, but it comes from the top two. Uh, we, we, in, I think it was uh, about, about now a year ago, we had a former um, member of parliament in the opposition party in the federal government. And, and I'm not being you know, partisan here, but it's just about the person. He's, he got expelled from the party and he's now an independent, but he, he put out in, in, in social media to, to basically say that our Canadian chief medical officer who was handling the pandemic. She grew up, she's a Chinese Canadian. She grew up in the UK, came to Canada and great resume. And he accused her of working for China. And it was a conspiracy. <laughs> Theory. And it's, you know, and that comes from people that are, have a voice in modern day Canada. So it does happen. Um, and those things have to stop. What I'm happy to see, and, and I can share some stats, but I, I am happy to see that there are some changes that's happening. Um, the minister, um, I live in um, a city called Markham right now, which actually there's a lot of Asian uh, Canadians there. And uh, the minister uh, who actually is what is obviously one of the writing minister, Mary Ng, she's been actually taking a leadership role and they recently announced an, an investment into a uh, further investment into a Canadian race relation foundation. And basically that's to actually address a lot of what's happening in Canada for anti uh, Asian racism and to support uh, Asians. But I was surprised at the stats and just to share with the broader group, because I, I took some of this from um, a, a few of these support groups that also are funded by the government. And this is where the government plays a role, right? The supportive piece, standing up for it. Um, basically, um, folks like the, the one government person I mentioned before getting expelled from the party for, for being associated with racism, period. I think that's so, so important. But some of these stats that come through um, also come through from these groups that are supported by the government because that way people can acknowledge this is really happening. So in Canada, for example, we have, I think they've logged over a thousand cases. Majority is in Ontario and BC. Vancouver alone, over 700% increase in reported claims since um, COVID happened. And the folks that are mostly attacked are under 18 and over 55 which is not surprising because they are probably seen as quote weaker. And most of the incidents that happen are being spat at, uh, coughed on, elderly being pushed down. And I think I heard, um, I think it was Jane that mentioned, or Olivia, I'm sorry, in, in Vancouver that they were scared or in BC. And I have a friend that's at an elder, he has an elderly mom that lives in Vancouver, BC. And she, she, he was just so upset because she texted him and said, where can I find Mace? 
so I can buy it because I'm so scared. And so this is a country that we all love. So I would say, no, we're not better. We may even not be a greater of a place, but I think having a government support and having that one champion, in this case, the minister is so important. And I think then her basically getting all her peers um, on board. I was lucky to be part of a round table that she was part of, but she's also engaged all the, um, all the uh, police chiefs across the country. How do we work with the communities in, in, in the different uh, uh, provinces? How do we actually understand and support communities? And you have to understand Asians, typically not all of them are as outspoken as the few of us on the panel. A lot of them don't want to speak up. It's part of the culture. Um, they don't want to call the police. They don't want to challenge. That's just part of it. And so I'm sure that that's a given you is very much underreported. Everybody answered. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for that, Rebecca. And and, and I, I don't want to um, cut off the discussion. I, I've, I've got our big wrap up question at the end, but just for the audience, um, when the United States created internment camps that act uh, to round up Japanese and Japanese Americans, it was done on the basis that uh, it was a it was a military necessity and uh, a protection against espionage and treason. So this notion of Asians not being loyal to their country or treasonous or national security risk is something you you know you've just alluded to here. And 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 six United States Supreme Court justices found that that was a lawful basis to inter tens of thousands. Of Japanese Americans uh, in in the West Coast in, in the United States. The second thing I just wanted to also thank the people who put the opening video segment together, a, a, a perhaps a non narrated but but very important image that we saw there was the signing ceremony for the COVID nineteen Hate Crimes Act in the United States, which was something that was fueled by um, by, by an attack against. Um, six women of Asian descent who worked at spas in the suburbs of Atlanta. Uh, we don't have a way of collecting this data, at least in the United States. And as you all know, as policy people or you know who work in this realm, data is the key to getting is the found is foundational for any kind of government response. And and I think actually for a response to appeal to people's minds and hearts as well. We we rarely understand the the extent of the problem. We we may put it out of our minds because it doesn't affect us, but. These numbers are staggering. I really want to get to the last question, and I apologize for doing it this way because we don't ask this question. I will have failed as moderator, and I think we would have missed the opportunity here with all of the wonderful people to to ask, you know, this this specific question. So we've heard so much today, uh, and have learned so much today, but um, from your perspective, uh, all panelists. How can we be better allies in this moment? And how do we talk about these issues with members of the Asian community who are hurting right now? Uh, uh, th this is not an easy topic. And for those who want to be allies and want to be helpful, we would love to get any guidance from you, including how can our corporations respond? Can you highlight things that you felt have been good responses uh, that you've seen in Canada and the United States, and and I think I want to start with Olivia, um, because I I, I think uh, w once she's unmuted, I I think she'll have some wonderful things to say on this topic. Olivia, floor is yours. Thank you, Clint. So the first thing I'll say is silence is tolerance, and tolerance is encouragement, and silence is truly killing us. It's the reason why we are unable to move and heed um, the what's happening in the states and also in Canada. I also wanted to bring up um, a point which I think is really important. We talked a little bit about the model minority myth earlier. And I think one of the things that corporations can do is really start to understand where this comes from. Asian Americans did not create this myth. It was created after World War II by the media, by Western society to place whiteness at the top of a racial hierarchy and blackness at the bottom. This allows society to use Asians as a wedge to drive these two groups apart. And what happens is, it's, is it denigrates black Americans. It erases the, the racism that we've experienced. It pits us against each other. And it also feels anti-blackness in the Asian community. 
And so I think for us to be allies, we cannot just see this issue of anti-Asian hate or racism as an Asian issue. It's an issue that is intersectional. It crosses many boundaries. And at the forefront of this conversation is the unity that has to exist between different marginalized groups. That's why I can't speak about Asian American hate without talking about the anti-Blackness that has fueled the violence between our communities and the communities that benefit from us fighting against each other. So with that, um, I'll just leave you with one more thing. I think it's imperative that corporations are investing in bystander training. I teach this. It's incredibly important because what we're seeing is harassment is happening inside of workplaces, on channels like Slack, on Microsoft Teams. It's happening in verbal forms first, and then it's accelerating and expanding into physical forms of violence and aggression. So bystander training should be the bare minimum that I believe organizations could should commit themselves to because we can't create true psychological safety in any of our spaces. We can't create true inclusive spaces if we're not able to identify signs of harassment first. So that's what I would recommend. And then lastly, because I teach human-centered design and empathy at a very strategic level to Fortune 500 companies, empathy is going to be so imperative in our training, not just as good human beings, but if you really think about a business perspective when we're creating products, services, and solutions, if we can't understand our customer's reality, if we can't suspend our bias or our judgment, we'll never be able to make something that is truly human-centered, something that is sticky, that is impactful, and that will truly drive business value. And so the companies that I work with understand how important this is. And that's why they're investing in techniques like the one I teach, which is one of the newest evolutions of human-centered design. So I think bystander training and empathy being taught institutionally will be the solution moving forward. I know you all were not counting on going to church this afternoon, but you've been to church. Thank you, Olivia. That was a yeah. really powerful words, really I powerful love. words. J Jane, why don't uh, why don't you why don't you take it take it next? Yeah, I want to double down on what she said because I think education is very important and training is very important. So, in our corporate arm where we do uh, corporate training and HR like wellness programs, one of the big things that is very important as a module is both the health education. You're really kind of setting the the basics. The the fact that um, you cannot blame the whole COVID pandemic on the race. That's very important in terms of the health perspective, but also on general uh, training for good corporate practices, HR practices, and uh, also mental health, right? So where we could really help with data, and I think that's where we're not only um, supporting just the Asian uh teams uh, within within your organizations, but the people around that, because over 50% of people have put up their hand and told us in their own way that mental health was a huge thing and the fact that anxiety has quadrupled. And as I said, mm -hmm. the data is really pointing towards the fact that they need support and corporations, uh, lots of the clients that we're working with are doubling down on mental health. And I think an important module of that is uh, scientific education, as well as racial sensitivity and bias education. Thank you, Jane. Julian, ha has anybody done it right in your opinion? And, and what's your advice to folks who want to be an ally in this moment? Sure, sure. Thank you, Clint. Um, so I don't know if we we, we have all the, the the answers, but certainly at Hydric, um, I co-lead our firm's uh, Professionals of Color Employee Resource Group, and what that entails is we have bi-monthly meetings um, virtually right now of course where we convene speakers and um, uh, folks who, who are experts in, in educating right and since education is key I was actually very very honored that I was able to get my friend Grace Congresswoman Grace Mung to speak to our firm uh, a few weeks ago uh, as it relates to the COVID-19 hate crimes bill that she co-sponsored with Senator Maisie Hirono. And so it's through forums like that, discussions like that, that we're able to highlight some of the issues and 
provide a forum for educating. But very importantly, Clint, I, I've, my, my co-leader and I, we made a very conscious effort to include uh, allies into, into this group. This is not just a safe space for professionals of color to you know, re rehash issues that we all know we face, but rather to bring in everybody so that we can all learn from each other and provide a, a venue for, um, for allyship. Um, one group I'll just mention very quickly because it dovetails into your point about, you know, tracking this and data. Um, in addition to the COVID-19 uh, bill that was signed by President Biden, which empowers the Department of Justice to track this, uh, there is another group that, that I've been very proud to be associated with, which just launched a few weeks ago, uh, called the Asian American Foundation. It's TAF.org. And I just want to bring it to everyone's consciousness because um, I, I was able to lead the search to find the CEO, Sonal Shaw. Um, and what's special about this group is that um, it is about allyship. The CEO of the Anti-Defamation League in the U.S., Jonathan Greenblatt, is a board member. Um, but some of the other founding board members are have been very successful entrepreneurs and business people. And they thought, if not us, who? And so the punchline is they went out into the launch, like I said, just three, four weeks ago with a commitment of 125 million personally and another matching 125 million. But what's really phenomenal is just in those two weeks, they have now raised another 750 million from corporate partners. So this is a, an avenue where the Verizons and the T-Mobiles and the Walmarts and the Amazons of the world are able to, to chip in. And I said Verizon, could I see my friend Howard on this call? Um, but this is where you know, money will matter. <laughs> that money will be used for grants, for other very worthwhile organizations, and for allyship groups. So again, I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention so that TAF can be a, a place where people can contribute both their time, energy, resources um, to help us all address, you know, this issue of anti-Asian hate. Thank you. Thank you. And and we are we are uh, winding down. Uh, I, I did want to offer uh, there was one question uh, in in the chat, um, and and I want to actually get get to this question if at all possible. Uh, this is from. Uh, v Spitz, uh, if if you could um, unmute yourself and, and ask while we have the benefit of our four wonderful panelists here, I'd like to to get your question on on the record. Thanks very much, Clive. It's um, it's not a not so much a question, but thank you all for honoring us with your your experiences and your observations today. Um, it's been very very revealing and uh, and rewarding. Um, I just wanted to mention that I'm quite involved with the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I chair the business school there, the Sauter School, and in working with uh, the president of UBC, um, Professor Santa Ono. Um, there's a national forum on anti-Asian racism that's taking place at the University of British Columbia on June 10th uh, and 11th, and it's a it's a national forum. And it's got some uh, amazing resources and speakers, and um, it's online. So I just wanted to point that out to the group if anybody would like to participate uh, in that forum. Um, I'm sure that maybe Scotty could send out some information or one of the panelists could send out some information or I can. But I think it's going to be an interesting experience. That's all I had, Clint. Oh, no, I, I appreciate that. As well as uh, Julian's plug here for this new organization, I think that's uh, whenever we can uh, be witness to the birth of a, of a new social justice movement and organization, we should uh, we should celebrate it and and, uh, and acknowledge it. So thank you all to the wonderful panelists for being here and sharing uh, what is very uh, deep uh, and emotional uh, truth with with all of us. And uh, I, I I can't wait to watch this uh, again and share it with other people. Uh, so I will turn it back uh, to you, Scotty, uh, and to Gary to close us out and and try to close it at two p.m on time, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. Uh, well, well done, everyone. And thank you. What a powerful conversation and an important conversation. Um, I want to say thank you, uh, not only to the panelists, but also to uh, the participants, because every single person on this call is uh, very serious. And we're honored to have all of you, our advisory board, our board, 
um, our friends that we're meeting for the first time, uh, our entrepreneur circle. So with that, I will give it to uh, the chairman of our board, Gary Clement, for the very last word. Uh, thanks a lot, Scotty. Um, listen, that was fantastic. Uh, really appreciated everyone uh, taking the time from their schedules um, to not only participate, but uh, for those who just joined to uh, listen, I hope to, uh, you uh, were able to get something out of this because I certainly have. And um, I, this, this is definitely a conversation that needs to continue. And um, I want to just offer my appreciation to uh, our guests who uh, shared their stories with us and and also to Clint uh, for his leadership in organizing um, these town halls. Uh, it's very much appreciated. And I just want to thank everybody for joining us.